Uh, we're going to see people trickling in, but we better get going. Wouldn't you agree? It's a lunchtime thing. And so, uh, but we are happy that you're here, this great turnout. So many Chicagoans, uh, colleagues from Loyola, from the School of Business, um, which is great to see people. Other colleagues from, on the faculty and staff and students from Loyola, glad you're here. Uh, Chicago professionals, uh, the Archdiocese has uh, representation. Our friends from Lumen Christie are here. Our friends from Catholic Theological Union are here. So it's a good cross-section of, of folks um, to be here. So I think what I want to do is just say grace, and then we can dive into our salads. And so, but I do want to, um, how to put this? I want to ask for kind of the patronage of a dearly departed friend who left our midst last week, and that's Bishop Kevin, Kevin Birmingham from the Archdiocese. So we, well, Kevin is, was a bright light, a stalwart, was the tr a, a, very, a true person, a, tr a truly gifted, humble, talented person who was taken so um, unexpectedly from us. So we wish him to be embraced by the loving arms of God. And we think of him here today and we ask for his, his patronage of our event. And bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Please dig into your salads, and I'm going to say a few words, and uh, off we go. So uh, we, we saw this, um, this, I, this opportunity to work with Quinlan, and Tony, uh, whose cathonomics uh, is a triumph, um, we were talking about the kind of thing to to say, the kind of title. And Tony uh, doesn't really pull any punches, and he said, how about against free market economics? <laughs> and we thought that, that, might, that might get some, some people in the room or get some conversation going. Um, it is a, com a compelling title. Uh, so free markets, you know, I'm not an expert, but free markets seem to be good at producing wealth, but fall quite short in engendering justice or well-being. This could be, uh, there could be some exceptions. See, but on the other hand, Catholic social teaching and the economic theories attached to the Catholic intellectual tradition, which are formidable and rather traditional and older than, older than you might think, these offer a, a different view, maybe more comprehensive. This is what's at issue today. Um, they have some, something to say about market economies and perhaps more importantly, who these market economies, who they're meant, meant to serve. Um, so, resisting free market ideology, Catholic social teaching emphasizes how the common good must take precedence in economic life. So Tony will be lecturing about that, and then he's going to have a really robust response from our guest from Loyola Marymount, our sister school to the West, Dr. Dale Smith. And so I'll just give you a couple of bios and then leave you to your, your dining. Uh, Dr. Anthony Annette is a visiting scholar at the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University in New York City. His work centers on the intersection of ethics, economics, Catholic social teaching, and sustainable development. He spent over two decades at the International Monetary Fund, uh, was a couple of rounds as a chief speechwriter over there. Um, Tony holds a PhD in economics from Columbia University, and a BS and an MLIT Bless you, Tony. Both from Trinity College, both these, those degrees are from Trinity College, uh, Dublin. Um, in addition to Cathonomics, how Catholic tradition can create a more just economy, which was published by Georgetown just last year, Tony's also co edited with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia and some others a book entitled Ethics in Action uh, uh, Ethics in Action for Sustainable Development, which comes from Columbia University Press, uh, 2022. So uh, let's welcome Tony, just as a, a hello there. Thanks, Tony. And then Dr. Dale M. Smith, who's the Dean of the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University. We welcome Dr. Dale Smith as well. And Dale has a PhD in organizational communication, an interdisciplinary degree from the Annenberg School and the Marshall School of Business from the University of Southern California. Dale serves on the Board of Trustees for Globally Responsible Leadership Institute, GRLI, and she's president-elect for the International Association of Jesuit Business Schools. For more about Dale and for more about Tony, uh, you, they're easily clickable. They have 
a lot of things that they're doing. So I would just would encourage you to look them up and to engage them. They're both wonderful people, wonderful scholars, wonderful public intellectuals. So with that, I just ask you to dig into your salads and we'll be kind of running this thing, you know, it's a lunchtime thing, so we'll be probably turning it over pretty quickly. Tony's gonna start a shade before noon. So, uh, and then you'll still see your main, your main dishes coming out, okay? So thanks for being here and bon appetit. We just kind of keep moving, so, uh, and Tony's gonna be um, giving substantive insights as we have our breast of chicken. So uh, it'll be kind of a, you know, the English majors say it'll be synesthesia. You'll have pleasure on multiple senses, you know, so intellect and for body, body and soul and mind. You know, here is the book, uh, Cathonomics, uh, how Catholic tradition can create a more just economy. And you can see, you know, the window there, it's got a bar graph in there. <laughs> so, so just FYI, I think Tony will have some bar graphs, but he also kind of eschews them in many ways. So um, with that, can you please help me in welcoming uh, the great scholar, um, economist, and writer, uh, Dr. Tony Annette, to our podium. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael, and for your warm welcome. And thanks to everybody here at the Hank Center and the broader Chicago community for welcoming me, welcoming me so warmly. And we very much appreciate that on this. Um, and thank you for coming out on this dreary, rainy day um, to talk about against free market economics. Um, what I want to argue this morning is that at least in the domain of economics, Catholic social teaching aligns itself well with a system known as either Christian democracy or social democracy, or what Pope Francis calls the social market economy. And that's not the same thing as free market economics. When we saw this, it really refers to a system we saw very clearly in post-war Europe, and to a certain extent under the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt. What is social democracy? And I'm going to use the term social democracy to encompass Christian democracy too as one umbrella term. Well, it is a recognition that the market economy must be underpinned not only by property rights, but by economic rights. It provides common goods. It uses the welfare state to protect people from swings of economic fortune and it boosts the power of unions to bargain for workers' fair share of economic prosperity. In a sense, social democracy makes operational Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, especially in the sense of guaranteeing a standard of living sufficient to allow participation in the economic and social life of nations. And there is Article 25, Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond this control. Now, we can contrast this rights-based approach with the free market economics or we could say economic libertarianism. This is an economic system that where the only rights recognized are property rights. Now it might allow for a minimum social safety net to avoid destitution, but there is certainly no sense of a common obligation to support the well-being of all people there is certainly no right to an adequate standard of living. Why do people promote this idea of the free market? I think in a sense it goes back to Adam Smith's famous insight that the invisible hand of the market <clears throat> would harness self-interest, market competition, and the division of labor towards increasing prosperity. And it is certainly true that markets are good at creating wealth. Nobody can deny that. The problem is that they're quite poor in distributing that wealth. 
Now, Adam Smith himself wasn't too interested in that question. He just assumed that markets would lift all boats, but that doesn't happen. Markets are compatible with vast amounts of inequality and social exclusion. The Catholic social teaching tradition starts from this foundation, that markets lead to great injustice, exclusion, and inequality. Starting with Pope Leo XIII in Rerum Novarum, it condemned the economic liberalism as then practiced during the Industrial Revolution and called for the state to protect the poor and workers for a just wage and for workers to be able to form unions and bargain on their own behalf. There's always been a condemnation in Catholic social teaching of what, of what Pope Pius XI called the twin rocks of shipwreck, free market libertarianism on one hand and communist collectivism on the other hand. And we should always keep in mind that when the tradition condemns socialism, it is referring to the collective ownership of the means of production and the eventual abolition of all major private property. Now, starting in the 1930s, Catholic social teaching became much more comfortable with democracy and with the role of the state in economic life. As documented by James Chappelle in his excellent book called Catholic Modern, this began with what he calls paternal Catholicism, calls to protect the family and the sole breadwinner. So that gave support to welfare provisions such as family allowances and also for bolstering industrial unions. It was fiercely opposed to communism, but it implicitly recognized that communism was offering something to workers that needed to be counteracted. There was another element in this new modern Catholic social teaching that Chappelle calls fraternal economics, fraternal Catholicism, sorry, which was more left-wing, more supportive of a larger welfare state, and more open to alliances with secular social democrats and socialists. But by the 1950s, both strands had more or less come together with the goal of supporting what Chappelle calls the consuming family in this new age of affluence. This was the golden era of Christian democracy. And as documented by the historian Tony Judd, there was a strong alignment between Christian democracy and secular social democracy when it came to economics. Both supported the state's role in regulating the economy in line with the common good. Both provided social insurance funded by taxes and social security contributions. And both empowered unions as a bulwark against excessive corporate power. And countries like Germany even went further by putting in place the systems of co-determination whereby workers were given a share in the governance and management of enterprises. The United States didn't have a social Christian democratic tradition, but the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt mirrored many of its elements. It certainly limited the excesses of the market, aimed at just and harmonious industrial relations, and provide and insured people from various kinds of market risks. It is no surprise, therefore, that Pope Francis can claim that the church supports what he calls the social market economy. Here's what he said. I do not condemn capitalism in the way some attribute to me, nor am I against the market economy. Rather, I am in favor of what John Paul II defined as a social economy of the market. This implies the presence of a regulatory authority, that is the state, which should mediate between the parties. It is a table with three legs, the state, capital, and labor. Now, this alignment between Catholic social teaching and social democracy could never have happened without significant developments in Catholic social teaching, especially with the Second Vatican Council and its all-important document, Gaudium et Spes, which really opened the church to making its peace with democracy and the modern liberal state. In my book, Catonomics, I list 10 principles of Catholic social teaching that I have derived from the tradition from Rerum Novarum in 1891 
through to Fratelli Tutti in 2020. What I want to do now for the bulk of my remaining time is to go through those 10 principles, which I will list here, and talk about how they can reflect this new understanding of social democracy. Let's start with the common good as defined by Gaudium et Spes as the sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. This has clear relevance to economic life, as Pope John XXIII put it. As for the state, its whole raison d'etre is the realization of the common good and the temporal order. It cannot, therefore, hold aloof from economic matters. The state, therefore, is called to guarantee the common goods of our common life together. And importantly, and unlike with the free market, nobody can be excluded from the common good. The second principle is integral human development. This was defined by Pope Paul VI as the good of the whole person and all people. It calls for a far broader notion of development than the merely material or the economic, emphasizing the fullest development of every person's capabilities and capacities. But to develop in this rather Aristotelian manner, people need the material basis of human flourishing, such goods as physical and economic security, access to food, housing, healthcare, education, opportunities for decent and dignified work, a sustainable natural environment. This is closely related to the common good. The third principle is integral ecology. This is the newest principle of Catholic social teaching. It comes from Pope Francis's great encyclical Laudato Si from 2015. This says that the relationships between human beings and the natural world are interconnected, deeply intertwined, and part of a larger whole. Accordingly, when we upset the balance of nature, we upset the conditions for human flourishing, especially for the poor. Therefore, this was not so central in the last century because we weren't fully aware of the environmental havoc our economic model is wreaking on the world, but today it must be a central priority going forward, not just because it is an environmental concern, but because it is a social concern, as Pope Francis put it. So therefore, any new social democracy is going to have to really prioritize protection of the environment. The fourth principle of solidarity, as defined by Pope John Paul II, as a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, the good of all and each individual, because, and this is the key part, we are all really responsible for all. Solidarity as a virtue is a super highway to the common good. It is a moral response to the interdependence of our human life. And in terms of social democracy, it calls both for the protection of the weak through the welfare state, and also for a strong role for unions in economic life as key zones where solidarity is practiced. Principle five is subsidiarity. This is probably, probably the most misunderstood and indeed misinterpreted principle of Catholic social teaching. It is often argued by libertarians that subsidiarity calls for a hands-off approach by government in economic life, but this isn't quite right. Subsidiarity means decisions should be taken at the lowest level possible, but the highest level necessary, and sometimes that level is the global level, by the way. It says that higher level associations like the state must help and support lower level associations. As Pope Francis puts it, subsidiarity means that when single individuals, families, small associations, and local communities are not capable of achieving primary objectives, it is right that the highest levels of society, such as the state, should intervene to provide the resources necessary to progress. This gives a, first of all, a clear injunction to support unions, which as Pope John Paul II said, are indispensable elements of the social life. 
But there is also a justification for a welfare state to help individuals and families so long as the help is not provided in a distant, demeaning, or overly bureaucratic way or which hinders the agency of those being helped. One example of how you can do this is through what's called the Ghent system in some European countries whereby unions implement social insurance schemes. So unions are, it's operation at the level of the unions, not at the state. The sixth principle I've called reciprocity and gratuitousness. This is most associated with Pope Benedict XVI. Contra Adam Smith, Benedict was concerned with embedding fraternity rather than self-interest at the very heart of economic life so that people will feel obliged to give a gift to the other without necessarily expecting anything in return. This principle of reciprocity is very important in economics and in human psychology. It seems to be how people treat each other in daily life, and it's how social trust is built up. And it is the bedrock of any successful welfare state, based on the notion that everyone contributes through their taxes or social security contributions, and everyone gets benefits, like healthcare, education, or pensions. It's how social insurance works. People pay to support those in need today, knowing that they too will receive help when they need it. That's reciprocity and gratuitousness. The next principle is, very, is crucial, absolutely central, and that's the universal destination of goods. Harking back to the church, to, to scripture, the church fathers and St. Thomas Aquinas, this principle says that the goods of the earth are destined for all people, not just the rich or those with more property rights. Pope John Paul insists that the right to private property comes with a social mortgage, and Pope Francis refers to private property rights as only a secondary natural right, not a primary right, a secondary right. Here's how Gaudium et Spes phrases it. In using earthly goods, therefore, man should regard the external things that he legitimately possesses, not only as his own, but also in common, in the sense that they should be able to benefit not only him, but also others. Now, some have argued that the universal destination of goods belongs to the domain of private charity in the sense that people are called upon to use their surplus to relieve the less fortunate. That's not wrong, but it also ignores a crucial institutional development. Gaudium et Spes itself says that this is implemented through a body of social institutions and Pope Paul VI says when private gains and basic community needs conflict with each other, it is for the public authorities to seek a solution to these questions with the active involvement of citizens and social groups. So clearly the universal destination of goods can be used to defend the approach of social democracy. The next principle is the preferential option for the poor, which is a very related principle. And this says that all human action and all public policy should be judged first and foremost in terms of how it affects the poor and the excluded. This is a marked departure from free market economics, which elevates those with the most property rights. The preferential option for the poor, I would argue, is closely related to John Rawls's difference principles which calls for the position of the least well-off to be maximized in a just society. And this principle calls on the government to take active measures to relieve the poor and even to eliminate poverty. The next principle, principle number nine, is economic rights, and this is also a central one. The church came late to the idea of universal human rights. It was only with the Second Vatican Council that it finally made its peace with some of the key civil and political rights of liberalism, such as freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of religion. But this opening was telegraphed by strong Catholic influences on the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights derived from theorists like Charles Malik and Jacques Maritain. 
It was Maritain who argued that all traditions could accept these human rights, even if the reasons for accepting them differed. Now, here's the key point. In Catholic social teaching, elevates economic rights as the central rights. That's revolutionary. It differs greatly from the Anglo-American political tradition, which simply does not recognize economic rights at all, despite the efforts of Franklin Roosevelt to propose a second Bill of Rights to codify economic rights in 1944, which went nowhere. It even differs from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which puts civil and political rights first and economic rights second. If you remember, the article I quoted earlier was Article 25. That's quite far down the list. But John, Pope John XXIII and Martyr and Magistra lists economic rights first. First he says man has the right to live, the right to life is first, and then the right to food, clothing, shelter, medical care, rest, and the necessary social services. These are the key rights. These are the rights of social democracy. This is how Catholic social teaching is most aligned with social democracy through the elevation of economic rights. Finally, I want to talk about justice. Justice means giving others their due, what is owed to them. Justice is central to social democracy, especially as John Rawls argued that it was achieved through fairness. It is also central to Catholic social teaching where it is regarded as a cardinal virtue. Now there are three types of justice in Catholic social teaching. There's commutative justice, that's the justice of contracts, agreements, and promises between two individuals. This form of justice is accepted by everybody, including libertarians. Libertarians, however, do not